Have you ever heard of a place, a hidden location shrouded in mystery that's been sealed shut for millennia? A place prophesied to remain closed until a very specific moment, the second coming of Jesus? That's right, folks. According to legend, this gate has just opened. But what secrets lie beyond? And what does this mean for the future? Join me as we dive deep into the history, the prophecies, and the chilling reality of this monumental event. Buckle up, because this is one rabbit hole you won't want to miss. The Temple Mount is the most contested area in the world. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all see this place as essential to their religion. The Golden Gate, or in Hebrew, the Gate of Mercy, is the center of this conflict. The gate was closed in 2003 by an Israeli court order to protect it from illegal excavations and used by Hamas-affiliated groups. But on February 14, 2019, the Jordanian Muslim Waqf, who was given administrative control of the Temple Mount following the Six-Day War in 1967, opened the area for Muslim prayer. Israel has tried to close the structure, but Palestinians continue to break in. Although Israel rejects any proposal from the Waqf to turn the structure into another mosque on the Mount, the Muslim community would like to turn the gate into either a prayer hall or an Islamic institute of learning. This is the current situation and the background of the battle for the Golden Gate. This is not a battle that started when Israel became a nation again, but it is a battle that is centuries old. Many would say that this is not only a physical battle but also a spiritual one. So why is this gate so important? Why was it sealed shut two times? Why is there a cemetery in front of it? In this episode, we will try to answer all those questions, as well as providing a good theological, historical, and archaeological background to the Golden Gate. Let's begin. The old city of Jerusalem is surrounded by a large wall which has eight major gates. The Eastern Gate, also called Golden Mercy Gate, facing the Mount of Olives is unique as it is sealed shut. It is believed to be the oldest gate of the old city. This gate, when it was created, gave the most direct access to what would be the area of the Jewish temple, as it is the closest location to where the temple once stood. Jews would pray near this gate to be as close as possible to the holiest side. The Eastern Gate was ultimately sealed shut in 1541 by the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman. However, prior to this time, the gate was closed in 810 also by the Muslims, then reopened in 1102 by the Crusaders, and then walled up again by Saladin, the first Sultan of Egypt and Syria, and the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty. The exterior face of the gate, as it remains from the 16th century, is a sealed double entrance that leads into two vaulted holes. Even though the face of the gate has a 16th century appearance, there is strong evidence that this gate stands on the remains of an ancient gate built by Jews, that led to the first temple built by Solomon himself. In Second Temple times, the Eastern Gate to Jerusalem was called the Shushan Gate. Jewish tradition says that the Jews returning from exile in the Babylonian and Persian empires carved on the Shushan Gate. An image of the palace in the Persian capital of Shushan as an appreciation to the kings of Persia for helping them rebuild the temple and later Jerusalem. But let's answer this question. Why are we even talking about this gate? Why is it so important? Actually, standing next to this awesome structure just sends shivers down your spine while imagining the future event that many believe could take place here today. Opposite the Golden Gate on Mount of Olives, you can see a huge Jewish cemetery. Every religious Jewish person wants to be buried here on the Mount of Olives because according to the Bible, this is where the Jewish Messiah will come to establish his everlasting kingdom. The necessity to be buried on Mount of Olives is connected to an ancient prophecy by the Jewish prophet Zechariah, who foretells that the Messiah will arrive and stand on the Mount of Olives. In Zechariah 14.4 we read, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And guess what? When the Messiah comes, there will be a huge resurrection of the righteous dead, and those that were buried on the Mount of Olives will see the Messiah first. No wonder this place costs millions of dollars to be buried. Additionally, many interpret that according to Ezekiel, another Jewish prophet, after the Messiah will come down on the Mount of Olives, he will enter the temple through the eastern gate. In Ezekiel 44, 
we read, Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord the God of Israel hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. The prophet Ezekiel also writes that the glory of God himself will re-enter the temple through the eastern gate in the final days. In Ezekiel 43, 4, we read, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. However, this gate is not only important because of the future events that surround it, but also because of the significance in the past. God has been using the eastern gate of the world city in his great plan of atonement and redemption since biblical times. Such as with the ritual of the scapegoat on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. When the high priest performed purification rituals on the Mount of Olives, he could see over the Shushan Gate and into the sanctuary of the temple. Because it is near the Mount of Olives, the Shushan Gate was used on the most holy day of the Jewish year, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in God's atonement process for the nation of Israel. According to the ancient Jewish writings in the Mishnah, two goats were purchased on Yom Kippur at the East Gate. One goat was sacrificed in the temple courtyard to make atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, because of the uncleanness and rebellion of Israelites, whatever their sin had been. Another goat, the scapegoat, was sent out through this eastern gate, after the high priest laid both of his hands on its head and confessed over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites. Then the hands were put on the goat's head with all the sins of the people of Israel on the goat. Someone led it through the east gate over a walkway that crossed the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives and then into the Judean wilderness, and tradition says over a cliff. Some believe there was a special archway that crossed the Kidron Valley so that no contact would be made with the dead bodies in the cemeteries, which would make the people ritually unclean. We must also remember that this gate is important for the Christians too. According to New Testament teaching, while the first Old Covenant scapegoat left the East Gate to make atonement for the nation of Israel, Christians believe that Jesus entered through this gate to usher in a new covenant atonement for the sins of all mankind. In Zechariah 9.9 we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble, and riding a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus descended the Mount of Olives in the east and entered Jerusalem through what many believe is the East Gate. He did this on the day known by Christians as Palm Sunday, the same day that Passover lambs were being selected and would be sacrificed four days later. According to the New Testament narrative, the people didn't understand it yet, but by waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna, which means save us now, they had selected Yeshua as their Messiah, their scapegoat and Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. It was only four days later that he would carry away all their sins on an execution stake, the cross, fulfilling the messianic prophecy in Isaiah 53, but that same crowd was yelling for his crucifixion a week later. But he is going to return and his return is going to be very different from his first coming. All of these events represent the fulfillment in whole or in part of very specific end-time prophecies that can be found in the Hebrew Scriptures. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, it wrote about the Eastern Gate, and it said that no one knows for sure why this wall was closed. But the best story is that when these walls were being rebuilt in the 1500s by Suleiman the Magnificent, that a rumor swept Jerusalem that the Messiah was coming. And they called the rabbis in and said, What does this mean? When the Messiah comes, he is going to come from the east. He is going to go through the eastern gate, and he is going to run all of you aliens out, and he is going to become the Messiah, the ruler over the earth. They dismissed the rabbis and the order was given, Seal up the eastern gate, put a Muslim cemetery in front of it. That will take care of the Messiah because he won't walk in a Muslim cemetery, and he can't go through a gate that's closed. Let me just contrast the two for you for a moment. The first time Jesus came, he came humbly on a donkey. He is going to return on a white war charger, the symbol of a victorious general. The first time he came, he came humbly to walk to a cross and die for the sins of mankind. But he is coming back to pour out the wrath of God upon those who have rejected the grace, mercy, and love of God. The first time he came, he came with eyes filled with tears. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. 
but it says when he returns, his eyes will be like white hot coals of fire, because he is coming in judgment. First time he came, he was given one crown, a crown of thorns which was pressed down upon his head, until the blood ran down upon his shoulders. But when he returns, he's going to come back with all the crowns of all the kingdoms of the world. Every time I bring a group up here to this particular spot, I give them that teaching, and talk about how the second time Jesus comes, he is going to ride down into that Kidron Valley, and he is going to ride up to that eastern gate, and it is going to blow open supernaturally, as we are told in Psalm 24. He is going to go up on that Temple Mount, and he is going to be coroneted the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to shift gears here for a moment and point out that the Eastern Gate is not only significant in Bible prophecy, it also plays a key role in a debate that literally rages among archaeologists. In Romans 12:18, the Apostle Paul advises, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This instruction acknowledges that while we cannot control everything, we are responsible for our own efforts to live in peace. It calls for personal responsibility in seeking harmony even in challenging circumstances. In the biblical narrative from Genesis, the serpent emerges as a potent symbol of Satan, the master of deception, leading humanity astray from God's path. This portrayal resonates throughout the scriptures, where Satan is frequently depicted as the ancient serpent, embodying trickery and malevolence. Yet, in various cultures, serpents also symbolize regeneration, metamorphosis, and positive change. Despite the Dome of the Rock's emblematic representation of tranquility, a startling incident recently disrupted its peace. During a prayer assembly, snakes unexpectedly emerged from beneath the temple, instilling terror and chaos among the worshippers. Such an unforeseen occurrence during a sacred time has left an indelible mark of shock and concern. The emergence of snakes, often associated with mortality, peril and malevolence in sacred texts like the Bible and the Quran, evokes a primal fear, symbolizing not only physical venom, but also the potential for moral decay and corruption. The Genesis account casts the serpent as a cunning entity, luring individuals away from righteousness. This image echoes across the Bible, where the serpent is a recurrent motif of evil. However, in some traditions, serpents are revered as emblems of rebirth and transformation. Christian doctrine reinterprets the serpent's role through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Damper 5 Sky Signals Over the Holy Land In 2011, a remarkable event occurred over Jerusalem. A formation of lights, possibly a UFO, was seen and recorded descending above the city before shooting upwards at incredible speed. This event, and others like it, have sparked curiosity and debate, especially as they take place over the Temple Mount, a site of deep religious importance. Such occurrences have led some to wonder about their significance. Could these be the celestial signs that herald the second coming of Jesus Christ, as mentioned in biblical prophecy? Scripture speaks of signs in the heavens before the end times, and while interpretations vary, these mysterious events in the skies of Jerusalem certainly provoke thought on the matter. Such sightings of unidentified flying objects in Jerusalem's skies are not as uncommon as one might think. The city's residents frequently report these enigmatic visitations, with new accounts emerging annually, fueling speculation and wonder about the phenomena above. In 2022, an American drone operating in the Middle East documented an atypical aerial entity, a gleaming metallic orb. Curiously, these UFOs often elude clear capture on digital devices, leaving many attempts to record them on smartphones in vain, resulting in indistinct footage. This limitation has led to intrigue surrounding the identity of those who have successfully filmed these enigmatic occurrences over Jerusalem's historic landmark, with the anonymity of the videographers breeding skepticism. The Bible teaches the importance of vigilance, especially regarding information and the unknown. Verses like 1 Peter 5, 8-10 admonish believers to be sober-minded and watchful, as the devil prowls like a roaring lion. Proverbs 4.23 advises guarding one's heart with all diligence. These teachings encourage discernment and caution, suggesting that while we should remain open to new experiences and knowledge, we must also critically evaluate the information we encounter. The mysterious lights over Jerusalem, then, serve as a modern-day reminder of the biblical call to vigilance, prompting us to question, to seek understanding, and to approach the unknown with a balanced blend of curiosity and wisdom.
Imagine encountering something truly extraordinary. Lights in the sky above the revered dome of the rock in Jerusalem. The sheer awe of such a sight would surely inspire immediate sharing and fervent testimony. Yet, the mystery deepens as the identity of the individual who captured these videos remains shrouded in anonymity, sparking curiosity and doubt among many. Could it be that all these remarkable sightings were orchestrated by a single hand? Such speculation casts a shadow of uncertainty over the authenticity of the footage. According to biblical teachings, witnesses to divine manifestations often feel compelled to share their experiences with the world. Yet, the silence surrounding the origin of these videos raises questions that linger in the minds of believers and skeptics alike. How is it that only those behind the camera lens were privy to these celestial displays, despite the bustling presence of countless pilgrims and tourists at this holy site? Scripture recounts instances where divine light illuminated the heavens, symbolizing divine presence and guidance. However, the peculiar detail noted by some, that the intense light did not directly illuminate the golden dome below, adds an enigmatic layer to the narrative. Could it be a sign of supernatural intervention? Or does it hint at digital manipulation? The ease with which modern technology allows for the addition of such effects leaves room for doubt and speculation. In the midst of fervent debate and divided opinions, believers are reminded to seek discernment and wisdom in discerning the truth. Whether these sightings are genuine manifestations of divine glory or cleverly crafted illusions, let us approach the discussion with humility and a steadfast commitment to seeking the truth. For in the pursuit of understanding, we draw closer to the mysteries of God's creation and the unfathomable depths of His divine plan. Amidst the swirling debates surrounding the authenticity of these videos, the divide between believers and skeptics deepens. Yet, as followers of Christ, we are called to seek truth with discernment and wisdom, anchoring our beliefs in the light of God's Word. In the pursuit of understanding, it's essential to examine the evidence with a critical eye, just as the Berians did in Acts 17.11, diligently searching the scriptures to test the validity of claims. As we scrutinize the purported footage of extraterrestrial visitation over the sacred dome of the rock, biblical principles guide our discernment. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to test everything, hold fast what is good, urging us to weigh every claim against the plumb line of God's truth. Upon closer examination, discrepancies emerge. The alleged spaceship appears minuscule against the grandeur of the dome, raising doubts about its otherworldly origins. Drawing upon the wisdom of experts like Robert Schieffer, who have dedicated their lives to investigating phenomena beyond our understanding, we find clarity amidst the fog of speculation. Through meticulous analysis, Schieffer unveils telltale signs of digital manipulation, echoing the admonition of Proverbs 14.15 that the prudent give thought to their steps. Indeed, the addition of artificial effects, visible at the video's edges, exposes the handiwork of human deception, reminiscent of the serpent's cunning in Genesis. As the debate rages on, echoing the contentious disputes of ancient times, we are reminded of the spiritual battles that permeate our earthly existence. Just as the Promised Land was fiercely contested throughout human history, so too are the truths of God's kingdom fiercely debated in our modern era. Yet, amidst the clamor of conflicting voices, one truth remains steadfast, the sovereignty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ whose word serves as our anchor in the storm. Let us therefore approach these discussions with humility, seeking not to win arguments but to illuminate hearts with the transformative power of God's love and truth. Damper 6. The Opposition for the Holy Land The phrase abomination of desolation isn't merely a distant prophecy. It's a beacon guiding us through the tumultuous times we face. Embedded within the prophetic words of Daniel, and echoed by our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. It warns us of a time of great trial and tribulation, when darkness threatens to overshadow the light of God's love. But fear not, dear friends, for amidst the chaos, there shines a glimmer of hope, the anticipation of the Third Temple. This sacred edifice holds a special place in our hearts, for it is here that we await the glorious return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Picture the Eastern Gate, through which our Lord made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, heralded as the King of Israel. 
This gate, steeped in tradition and prophecy, serves as a tangible reminder of God's faithfulness throughout history. As we reflect on the significance of the Eastern Gate, let us remember its symbolic closure, awaiting the return of our Lord. This closure isn't just a physical barrier, it represents our spiritual readiness for His imminent return. For when that gate swings open once more, it will usher in a new era of divine presence and redemption, fulfilling God's promises in a spectacular display of His glory. In these uncertain times, let the abomination of desolation serve as a poignant reminder of our calling as Christians, to stand firm in our faith, unwavering in our trust, as we eagerly await the blessed hope of Christ's return. Is what appeared by the Dome of the Rock a sign of otherworldly intervention, or a marvel of natural phenomena yet to be understood? What implications does this event hold for our understanding of the universe and our place within it? May the Eastern Gate stand as a beacon of light in a darkened world, guiding us ever closer to the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Stay vigilant, stay faithful, and keep your eyes fixed on the Eastern Gate, for there lies our ultimate hope and salvation. Let us stand in awe of the Dome of the Rock, a symbol of faith, unity, and reverence for the divine. As we marvel at its beauty and contemplate its rich history, may we be inspired to deepen our own spiritual journey and embrace the timeless truths it represents. Let us carry forward the lessons learned within its sacred walls, spreading love, compassion, and understanding in a world often fraught with division. And as we bid farewell to this magnificent structure, may our hearts be filled with gratitude for the opportunity to witness such a profound testament to the enduring power of faith. Amen.